In ancient Greece, voters would cast their ballots by dropping a stone into an urn. Oftentimes, the urn was obscured behind a partition. Voters would come through and drop their, drop their pebble into the urn. The sound would signify that was one vote cast. The, being obscured, your vote was anonymous. Today, we have, moved, have to move far beyond that. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Carl Curl. I'm the president of the Govern Group. And I'm going to talk about how we're changing the world one election at a time. I want to talk about our partnerships and what are, for everything from a business aspect. Essentially, we're going to go through and talk about our value proposition and what it's going to do and interact with all of our partners. And there's our basic agenda. So why change the world? What is going wrong with modern elections? I want to paraphrase one of our partners and talk about elections today as a theater. It's not just about casting a vote. It's about the whole process. And today, it's falling apart. I'm not talking about just here in Seattle or King County. I'm talking about worldwide. Fledgling third world countries are trying to get started. I'm talking about lack of in election integrity. We can't trust what's really going on out there. Everybody remembers back a few years ago during the presidential election and the problem with hanging Chad? Well, that's an easy one. How many people here know about what happened in Pierce County two years ago? After the election was counted and reported, they found a whole box of ballots behind a copier in the office. Those votes didn't count. We also have an example a couple years ago in the Midwest. When they were tabulating everything, all the, all the votes, on a spreadsheet, they, where they copied and pasted, they put it into the, wrong count, into the wrong column. Shortly thereafter, it was reported, and then they discovered their mistake after it had been reported and the candidates notified. The news, whether it's true or fake, is loaded with examples about Russian meddling. And I'm not even sure exactly what all those details are. And I'm not even sure how much of that is fake news or hype. But it's the perception that there's a problem out there. And because of that perception, there's a lack of confidence, eroding confidence today. And with eroding confidence comes lower participation. We believe the blockchain can help solve this. Things that we've heard about for a long time, it's immutability. It's privacy, how voters can be anonymous, yet verifiable. So what is Govern and how are we actually going to do this? How are we going to change this? Govern is actually three different organizations. We have Govern, which is our foundation. We have Decision Associates, which is our platform developers. And we have Election Trust, which is our election management. Starting with Govern, Govern Our Foundation isn't a foundation to make sure that we're writing the right code or we're writing the right software. It's really the foundation, the publicly facing nonprofit organization that is facing the, company, the, the world out there. It is going to help push democracy to third world countries. It's going to help within our own country. Our goal is to help push the blockchain and its solutions to every organization out there. Additionally, by doing that, it's going to then help create more cycles and more churn within our own platform and within our chain. We have Election Trust. Election Trust is actually a 20-year-old election management organization. In elections, there's two ways to do it. One, you can have a third-party management. They actually come in and run the entire election. This happens a lot of times when we don't actually trust the people who are running the organization. Or Election Trust also offers just, we'll run the election for you, we will provide all the software, and it's all self-service. Self so Election Trust has the customers. Election Trust is known out there in the community, not just in the US, but also overseas. And the third part of our organization is Decision Associates. 
This is where all the technology sits. This is the group of people that have come together to build the solution that actually interacts with everybody else. I'd like to introduce our team. My name again is Carl Curl. I want to introduce Chris Hancock. Would you come up here, please? Oh, Chris is our chief technology officer. I've actually known and worked with Chris for about 15 years. We've worked on multiple projects just like this. Multi-tier, multi-organizational solutions. Next, I'd like to introduce John Bowden. John's actually back there, so he can't come too far. John has been working in elections and managing elections for over 30 years. John is an amazing person to get to know. He's got some funny stories about really big names out there. Presidential candidates that he actually drove around Seattle and um, had a little bit of fun with. <laughs> No, not in public. John has the experience. When we talk about driving elections out there, whether they're internal or out to the world, John knows the rules. John understands the rules of the road. And we have Mark. Mark is one of our strategic advisors. Mark, can you stand up, please? There he is. Mark, Chris, and I actually worked on multiple projects also over the years. How long have we known each other? About 15 years? So what is, what is govern? We have lots of fun, fancy words up here, but it's really about the services. It's really about the solution. The govern group, again, we have the govern, which is um, our nonprofit managing outside, but it's also building the technologies inside. We're not gonna try to do this alone. We have chosen and we've started to work with some very select partners, uh, such as Netvote. Netvote has an amazing protocol that we're partnering with to help deliver our services. And I'll show you an illustration of that in just a minute. We also have a hybrid voting technology bridge. That's a lot of fancy words. But essentially, we know that probably in our lifetime, we are not going to see public elections 100% digital or on the blockchain. It's going to take a lot of time. There's going to be a lot of jurisdictions. A lot of people don't want to go and use technology. We have a hybrid solution that can actually bridge this. We have very successful solutions that are both analog and digital, and at the end of the day, they're all blockchain based. I wanna point out again is the expertise. We're not just a bunch of technologists that have come together to say, oh, let's build an application. This is not about an application. This is about the deep technology and the deep interfacing and the expertise such as John who's bringing to the table. This is also about building a community. I look around this room, and I'll touch on this in just a minute, but this is part of the community. What we're trying to do, and what we have to do, is use the entire community to build and deliver our message. So what's, what's our true value proposition? Now, if we had the scotch, we could actually play a little drinking game and see how many times we say the word partnership. But our solution, our value proposition is really that end-to-end -end solution. We're not gonna build software that takes something all the way from a platform and pushes it all the way up to the voter. We're partnering with several key people to build that platform. Our chain is one of them. There's no way we could build our own blockchain solution. We have to partner. We have to partner with NetVote for the protocols, for pushing and managing that data back and forth. We have to partner with the networks that already exist out there. We, of course, are going to be primary in the interfaces. But most importantly, we have to partner with the governing bodies. Our laws and elections commissions here in the United States, even here in Western Washington, are very different than around the world. We're not just going to create a piece of software that we expect a foreign election body just to, just to take. We're building the solution that's going to allow it to be customizable to meet their laws and regulations while still being scalable that it can go across multiple jurisdictions. And of course, we have the elections and the voters. The voters don't care about all the background. Oh, they wanna know, they wanna make sure that it's secure and using the buzzwords is great for them. But what they care about is did their, did their vote count? Is that pebble that I'm putting into that urn really gonna be valid? Is it gonna be counted? Is it gonna be counted correctly and on time? 
our value proposition, oh no, 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 that was a false alarm. Oh, sorry. Go back, there we go. Our value proposition is really creating the end-to-end -end solution. And not from a technology point of view necessarily, but also from the, from the workflow point of view. From getting that election official, what they need, while still creating and, and adding to the whole blockchain environment and community. It's a balance between technology and actual um, workflows. Okay, let me reload. So this is an example of our actual model. If you guys see, we're, we're right in the middle. Our platform sits on the NetVote protocol and on the blockchain. Here specifically, we're calling out our chain. In order to get out to the polling and private elections and public elections, we need an identity platform. We, if, if we try to create our own identity platform, we would be creating a pigeon toll that's not necessarily gonna be successful. We have to rely on a partner that's creating and establishing a valued identity. If we take a look at the three tiers, polling, there's a big difference between polling and elections. Polling is non-binding choices. It could be anything from, what's your favorite ice cream? Nah, but that's probably not a good blockchain example. How about all-star all -star voting? Instead, we fill out the little card at the stadium and hope that our, our vote for our favorite player goes in. And then we have private elections in the middle. Private elections really deal with corporate governance. It deals with social groups. Uh, it could be a homeowners association. It could be a union. Um, private elections is probably one of the largest markets out there. And we participate, probably all of us in this room, in private elections and not really recognize that it's a true election. And of course, public elections, state, local, and even special tax districts, such as water districts or sewage districts, all make up the different type of platforms that would write on top of this. So why our chain? Well, honestly, we wanted to pick a partner that we believed in. One of my favorite things about our chain is the community it built. It's everybody in this room. It's all of the members. It's also the leadership. And when I'm talking about leadership, I'm not talking about necessarily an R chain leader. I'm talking about the individuals in this room. I'm talking about people adding to the community. And I wanna challenge everybody in this room to be a leader at some point. You might be an informal leader, but you might just be contributing to something. Each one of us in this room taking time to come to presentations and to learn about other organizations can be a leader out there. Be a leader within your own organization, but most importantly, be a leader in the community and give back to the different communities. I love the ecosystem that we're living in. And again, that's part of the community that, that we're here tonight. The formal partners, there's a lot of formal partners and we can read all about it in all the different tweets that we see. And a lot of formal contributors. But again, everybody in this room makes up the membership and everybody adds to the informal uh, partners and contributors. And I think, uh, contributions and changes can actually take place at our level, sometimes easier, quicker, and faster than going through all the bureaucracy. How big is the market? This slide actually had a lot of noodling by our group. Just how big is an annual global market for elections? We took a look at polling and voting and governance of organizations. And we settled on 45 billion. Some of our research actually indicated that it's far north of this. Some of our in the, uh, research indicated, well, it might not be quite this large. One of the biggest markets, of course, is all the foreign democracies out there. There is tremendous growth opportunities and, uh, um, and growth, especially for emerging countries out there. What are we doing about Yes, what are we doing about trust? People in general don't trust their cell phones and we want them to trust the cell phones. What are we doing about it? We do have, uh, we, we've seen a little bit of the discussion about hybrid voting, bringing in paper uh, and the electronic. And 
we're taking advantage of that to help address the issue that people have confirming that the vote that actually made its way to the block is the vote that they cast on their device or at the polling place or whatever. The idea is, if you look at uh, a lot of the solutions and a lot of the existing voting solutions are in some ways hybrid right now. What happens is, is people fill out the, the punch cards right or they fill in the dot, whatever it is, and those things get scanned and they turn into electronic votes in a sense. Um, but there's all kinds of issues of, of confidence with that and also the fact that votes can keep coming because once you separate the vote from the voter, we no longer have a way to uh, know that we have a valid count, which votes are valid and which votes are not, which is why this problem in Pierce County, finding a box of votes behind the, you know, behind the printer can happen. And this is a common problem. We've seen this in King County a number of times uh, where votes have appeared and they seem fortuitous for somebody and not fortuitous for somebody else. We're able to address that by making sure that all the votes that come in electronically are accounted for, are tied to a ballot in a way that has meaning to the system, even though we preserve an anonymity. Um, but then we can use some of our hybrid technology in order to make sure that the voter themselves knows that what they put in on their phone is what actually made it to the chain. So it's a concern we're keenly aware of because we know anything could be rooted and then it becomes a problem. I just want to jump on that and, and add to the fact that what you're talking about is trust, correct? Right. So if we apply trust to this specific uh, uh, situation of an election or a balloting event, um, currently the, the public sector in the United States anyway is attempting to deal with that in terms of how they audit elections after the ballots have been cast. Um, the current trend towards what's called risk limit audits seems to be catching on and there's now federal funding that just uh, appeared on the scene in the last month that's going to allow states to go and actually pursue what are called risk limit audits which is a statistical uh, sampling of ballots to ensure that in fact the results were what was cast on paper. Um, when we're attempting to introduce a blockchain solution as an option in voting, we need to be able to uh, integrate with that risk limit audit to gain the uh, trust of the public um, election officials and we think therefore getting the trust eventually of the voter because it is all about the voter in the end. So your question is right on the money in the sense of where we need to ob obtain that trust but we're going to earn it through the hybrid solution that we're going to introduce into the public sector hopefully within the next two years. Uh, we're going to be trying that out, testing it in the private sector until we have it down and when we're ready to go we're going to be hopefully driving it into the public sector and we'd love to be able to allow for people to vote in the public sector with risk limit audit options to verify their trust for the 2024 presidential election. It's a slow process, we understand that, but we're in it for the long haul. The, the question is what's the process of, of, uh, of ha operating a valid life ID and the, the way to do that, answer that would be to invite somebody from Life ID up here to talk about it. Sure, sure, let me take a shot uh, at that. So the way that we've architected the solution is we have abstracted away the issue of identity from being, uh, the issue of identity is a core part of the platform, but the identity provider is not, right? We have, we have a, an API that we've provided uh, and we can fulfill interfaces to that. So we have requirements, then we use Life ID uh, as a provider to fulfill interfaces. But when we look at some simpler election situations like some of the early private elections that we plan to take on. So it's noted that John has the existing election trust business, he has existing private election companies, and they are private elections that he has to deal with. They have similar problems, right? We have to have a known uh, list of voters, we have to establish identity, but the identity in that case is a much simpler process. It's a low risk process. We have, you know, 20 to a few hundred voters, right? It's a, it's a much simpler thing, so in that case, we implement a different version of the interface where we take essentially a voting role. We, we give, you can think of it as goods out, something like that, and that's how we create identity. In the long run, that's not what we want to do. In the long run, we want to see everybody, you know, using uh, KYC to establish that we actually know who you are in the real world, we know who you are on the blockchain, and then we have real confidence in that. That process, though, is a fairly open uh, discussion right now. Uh, talk with a lot of people about how it is that we create those kind of claims. 
verify those claims, turn them into something that's sufficiently satisfactory for something like voting. We have a lot of ideas about it, but I think it's a really fertile space for people to be thinking about. Right, so, so he just wants to know how we handle ID and who's who. Okay, so, so imagine that we actually have a circumstance where we have 20 voters, and those 20 voters are in fact uh, have life IDs, let's say. They have, they have an ID that's been created and associated with a claim that's associated to them in real life. In a case like that, we would want to start out with the voter roll, right? So in most cases, we know who the possible universe of voters are for a given vote. And that voter roll is going to come to us as public keys, right? And so when the person comes in and they do and they use their vote, they're going to come in with their key, and we're going to be able to match that up and actually verify that that's the person that voted and that they're allowed to vote, you know, one one time, or if they re-vote, then we, we cast the prior vote away. So it's, it, does that yeah. get at it? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna take, take on that. That actually brings up a great advantage of remote electronic voting, in, which is best done on blockchain which is in the states of Washington, Oregon, Colorado, we have mail-in voting. If you vote here, you know that it's uh, a matter of actually filling out your ballot at home, putting it in a secrecy envelope, dropping it in a delivery envelope, putting a stamp on it, and sending it in for tabulation. Um, should your wife or anyone else uh, stand over you and demand that you vote one way or another, or in fact, grab your ballot and vote for you, there's no way now for us to know whether or not that happened. Um, if we're able to uh, launch a blockchain ballot, which is essentially open throughout the entire election window, you could be coerced any number of times to vote the way the person wanted you to vote, and then once they've left the room, you can turn around and actually vote the way you chose. So the ability to uh, recast your ballot uh, securely with a life ID on blockchain is far superior now to the way we vote one time on paper, put a stamp on it, forget about it. The question is, will this get to the point that anybody can call an election and to be cheap enough that it can be run? Yes, and trusted. And trusted, the most important part. That's a good question. Our bet is yes. The, the fact of the matter is, uh, and cost, let me, let me speak to that if I could, because tokenomics is an interesting thing. It's, a lot of it's theory at this point, but a lot of us are staking our careers on the fact that it's going to work and that it's going to work well. And given what our chain is building, uh, we think there's a dynamic network effect that's going to happen once we're able to um, interact with one another, be it Life ID or uh, Digital Town or any of the, of the other um, ventures that are being launched now. The, the idea that um, votes would be cast and powered by a gov token or a govern token that might also involve interactions with a life ID token, may involve uh, uh, interaction with a digital town token. There may be, in fact, a way for, the, for, for voters to crowdsource fund back to the election administrator the cost of actually running the election. So you may find someone like King County very interested in, and motivated to move towards a, an option that would allow voters to choose to vote off paper and on blockchain that would in fact, um, in, in a larger sense, help fund the mechanism that the state otherwise would not give them. Uh, finding monies in Olympia or any other state capital is very hard now to improve, to even maintain voting systems, let alone improve them. We think there is a, there's going to be a, a tremendous advantage for uh, election officials in the public sector, in any case, to look at what tokenomics might be able to provide in terms of funding options. So that's not exactly the answer to your question, but I think it'll speed the uh, plow, so to speak, in uh, tilling that ground down the line. What's the cost for special elections? What's the, co what's the cost? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, numbers out. I'll get back to you with an R, you okay. with a response. No, 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 uh, today. <laughs> Oh, uh, elections can cost, get, again, one thing we should make, it, there, there's a difference between a voting application and running an election. It's like having a really fine-tuned engine but no chassis, steering wheel, or GPS. You need to be able to go somewhere and you have to know where you're going and you, and you have to be able to steer it. So uh, what we're providing is basically an election environment around blockchain voting application or protocol that will allow election officials at various levels, whether it's private sector or public sector, 
to actually execute and administer their elections. The cost would be driven by the complexity of that process, which is, you know, list of voter, voter registration, list management, uh, replacement ballots, whether you're hybrid or not. It's a lot of factors in there. So, John, the question is basically, are we going to be providing a platform for analytics uh, of election data? Um, and the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, my experience, my background uh, in a lot of my professional career, and also uh, Kevin, who's back there and, and has not come up here, but will now raise his hand when people look at him, uh, is, is architecting for us. And we've been uh, looking at systems and working with systems for many years that are about pushing large data sets into systems and then pulling them out, right? You wanna make it easy to push the data in, you wanna make it meaningful to pull the data out. And, uh, and we're keenly aware of that. Um, blockchain actually kind of lends itself to thinking this way just because of how expensive it is to put large data on the blockchain. So uh, we know that we have to have a substantial and robust off-chain solution in order to address some of this. We know that we're gonna have the data available to do some of those interesting things. Uh, we also know that at least at the start, we're going to provide some amount of analytics. We have to report on the results of elections uh, and sometimes those reports, based on the kind of election, can be very interesting, just by the very nature. Uh, if you look at ranked choice voting, if you ever uh, read about that on Wikipedia, you'll see that the results are actually kind of interesting to look at. We want to make that, sadly, sexy, uh, at least in our world. Uh, and uh, you know, there may be other opportunities for people to do even more about, more with that. So you're suggesting, we right? So with the vote casters, uh, would we be able to sell that data? To other people. I mean, in the public case, the answer is clearly no, but in the public case, a lot of the data is necessarily publicly available. You know who voted, uh, and you know what votes were cast, right? You don't know who voted for whom, but that information is available. Uh, in private data, is it impossible to imagine situations where the, where the private people want to mine that, or where they want to be in some kind of consortium that shares data? I, I think that's possible, but it would be yeah, an opt-in, it would be, you know, it's a challenge. I mean, look at, look at, is this, that's it, it's, it's over. <laughs> Did you turn it off? Yeah, I don't think so. Reboot it. Blue screen. Off. Oh yeah, no, I, I can be plenty loud. That's not a problem. All right, so if you look at Facebook and what's happening with them right now and their selling of data, it's highly controversial and it's not voting data. So I, I think that there are some real risks if we were to do that, but I'm not averse to new revenue sources. If we can figure out how to make things work, I think it's great. But trust is our primary product, right? But and you'll so remember we we're also that. going to be doing polling, which could be market yes. research, yeah. and may very well upfront just state that this, you know, this information will be for sale. It will, if we can anonymize that, we can. More people are going to be interested in going ahead and, and authorizing that data to yeah. be used in aggregate. That's uh, that's really where polling is going to go, especially in terms of predictive markets. Um, I believe you mentioned that. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a huge market there. We're launching the company around voting because frankly that's what's in premier in people's minds and we think it's the most urgent um, uh, solution that we can provide. But longer term, we're gonna be building a pr platform that's gonna horizontally work across a lot of verticals, including polling market research. So, so, so do me a favor and, uh, yeah, I, I'll repeat the question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for a little clarification. So the concern is, is that, no, first of all, I said, it sounds like a great solution. Okay, I thought that that should be on there. Okay, so, so the second thing is uh, that the KYC seems like potentially the weakest uh, element in the trust process, I think is accurate. I have concerns about KYC, uh, I understand. I'm interested to know what your specific concern is about it. So. Right, so, 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 so the thrust of the concern is that uh, we know that there's a lot of bad uh, verifications out there. I mean, if I would look at the claims verification process and we want to close the loop, and in many cases closing the loop is closing the loop against some not very good data sources to begin with. Accurate. That's a huge concern. And, and, and for us, it's a, it's a cart horse problem, right? We know that we need better verified claims in the system. We have... Uh, we have some other discussions going on with various people about how we improve that. We, we have a little bit of a benefit that our first, uh, can, can I keep this thing going, cart horse, our first horse out of the gate, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm killing this thing, beating it to death. So uh, it, it, we, we think that early on it's fairly, a fairly cheap problem because we have 
relatively well-known voter sets. Like I say, at a private election, small voter sets, let's say we just do a homeowners association to begin with, it, it, we can, you know, and low risk, that's fairly easy. When we started to get into the bigger things and when we look at voter rolls and we know that the voter rolls themselves are problematic uh, and we have to try and tie the person back, to, you know, the person who, who has their, uh, their, their key uh, to their real life persona, we know that that's really difficult, okay? Um, we have some ideas about how to solve that, some ways that we can generate some uh, uh, real provable IDs. And uh, I'll just uh, give you a, a, a general sense of it. It has to do with the expense in terms of time and effort to create a fake ID. Fake IDs that are really good for, um, uh, for, for committing fraud are those that are easily obtained, right? I steal some credit cards, I steal some social security information, I tie those things together you know, with some fuzzy logic and voila, I'm enough of that person. Actually, it turns out that there are some systems that it's really hard to become enough of that person if you go through them. Uh, we see it in property sales, uh, various titled sales. We see it actually, interestingly enough, having to do with insurance purchases, health insurance purchases. It's very expensive. Health insurance is expensive and it's complicated and those identities turn out to be really pretty good. Now, am I saying that voila, we, we can turn all of those things into you know, votes that we can trust through KYC? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we see some processes that are possible and we're gonna try and do what we can to engender those over time to improve the quality of, of what we see coming in. I think we should probably uh, let the next person. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you, everyone. This yeah, is thanks. this is great. Thank you.